All right, good evening. Hope you're good. Uh, tonight we have a very special two hour uh, Instagram Live special with Giant Step. Uh, and we're going to be celebrating the musicians uh, who really created the Giant Step sound. I mean, we, we did something with the DJs. Uh, and uh, tonight we're going to talk to some of the musicians. Um, there were a lot of musicians, but uh, we're going to do the, the sort of the original four who uh, really sort of uh, helped condense that sound. And then obviously it got augmented by a lot of very, very talented other guys like Jay Rodriguez, Bill Ware, Josh Roseman, uh, Fabio Mugera, um, Jonathan Marin, um, uh, Tomango. The list is pretty endless, but um, um, we're good. So we're going to do it in two parts. As you know, Instagram Live, uh, each section is only an hour. So for the first section, uh, I'm going to have Richard Worth. Uh, and then I'm also going to have uh, Gordon Clay, Nappy G. Um, and then for the second hour, you guys are going to have to switch over. We will do Ital and Genji. So I'm just going to have Richard join me now. Invite him to join. Here we go. Uh, and Richard, so you guys know, is actually in the UK. So this is an international version today. So just waiting for Richard to join. Um, here we go. Richard Worth. <laughs> I, I've just got to set this up. I'm, on, I'm using my daughter's cell phone because I don't have a smartphone. And she made a stand out of paper for it. So it's sitting on her paper stand. There we go. Okay, but that's me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, al I'm also going to put my headphones in. Are you getting any feedback from me? No. Music split. No. I'm going to put headphones in. So, Richard. Hello. Yes. How, <laughs> how, how, how are you? doing. How are you? So I'm good fine. to see you. I've got nothing um, to complain about. Good, good. That's, that's great. Um, so, I mean, it wouldn't be right to talk about 30 years of Giant Step without you because um, you were responsible for so many things around sort of the sound. Um, and sort of the direction, musical direction of, of where we went, uh, not only as a as the club, but also as a, as, as a, comp as a company. Um, so I, I want to, um, and I hope you've had a chance to look at the the vault as well, because there's lots of uh, lots of pictures of you and uh, stuff in there as well. Um, so wanted to, you know, if you could tell people a little bit about sort of how you got started and sort of your early influences growing up in England and how you ended up in New York when you did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm from a village in the countryside, um, in Lincolnshire. And, but, you know, I, 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 I went to university. I mean, my earliest musical influences are, are literally, um, honestly, some of it was singing in a cathedral because I was in a choir. Uh, and, and for those of you who are musos, ancient modal carols did influence me somewhat. So they set up a certain sound in my head. But anyway, then I go to university. I, I like all the normal sort of popular music. Where did, you go to, where did you go to university? Well, way up in Scotland. I wanted to get away. So Dundee. And Dundee okay. had a good... The Scottish Arts Council have always had a great jazz scene. And so I got to see Don Cherry and I got to see David Murray. I got to see all these like those uh, 1980s sort of post free jazz players. Um, and, and I became a massive jazz fan anyway. And I was buying records. I was, you know, that, like, as you did back then, taking secondhand records down, selling off my Rush records to buy like, you know, um, the, to buy the, the Duke Ellington and now buying back the Rush records with the Duke Ellington, you know, and, all that. and so but I was doing economics degree. I had no, I I'd had flute lessons so I could play the flute, but I had no really real formal education other than lots of music singing in a choir. So I went to London and was a bike messenger and just played as much as I could, uh, self-teaching, uh, which was hard back then without the internet, you know. Mm -hmm. It was all about going and buying, you know, books of jazz theory and going to every jam session with people like Phil Benton, you know, Courtney Pine would turn up and those kind of people. Um, this is like 1988, and uh, I just realized that I really wanted to go to New York. Had, so you, been to, had you been to New York before? No, the before? first time I went to New York, I had a few connections to go, and as soon as I got there, I was straight off to the to the knitting factory. Uh, also, of course, looking for hip hop. That was the, you know, there was the double thing. I wanted the jazz, and I wanted the hip hop. And of course, I was also long into funk, so I wanted all of that. And, and what, what year was this? 
so this would this would be 89 88 89 this would be the first time when i met you guys so what happened was i literally carried my flute everywhere and but Rick, richard sorry to disturb you but we have a we, we there's a picture of you on the dance floor at the paradise garage next to keith herring and it's yeah. the, the, the last week and that was 87 so explain oh, yourself okay. so maybe i'm maybe i'm misremembering <laughs> so maybe maybe this was okay so maybe i did go i was thinking it all happened on my first trip so maybe maybe that's it i came back blown away by new york worked as a bike messenger because i got my economics degree but i wasn't going right. to go into like anything um and then i so it must have been another trip out when i then i'm walking around with my flute and playing in Washington Square Park, going to University of the Streets jam sessions mm -hmm. on 6th mm -hmm. Avenue. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sorry, on 2nd, uh, no, Avenue A and 6th Street. Um, and then I saw the giant step flyers and I walked over to SOBs and I had my flute and Mac mm -hmm. saw me and said, hey man, we need musicians. We and needed he, people, we needed bodies. Yeah, he, needed people. <laughs> he may have just let me in. Uh, I think so, yeah. He charge really. me. You want I to went come in? in and <laughs> now it, it was smashed that first night. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Jamalski's on stage and there's a bunch of rappers milling around. And I, I just went for it. I just grabbed my flute and said, said to Smash, man, I can play over a beat. Because of course I'd seen some of this happening in London. It, there had been some, some of this going on. But also because I'd been listening to so much hip hop. Literally, I used to get two turntables and play Ornette Coleman record over a hip hop, over like the B side of a Run DMC record to listen to how Ornette Coleman sounded over a breakbeat. So I was kind of getting a sense of what I wanted to do anyway. So I went up and I, I played. And I just remember that Jamalski kind of opened up the mic for me. I played. Jamalski's like, okay, and then rap. And then let's hear the flute play again. And so <laughs> he and I just kind of got into it. Then I got off. That was the key. I didn't go on too long and then smash like go up again man you know a bit later and that's what we did and then you guys talked to me yeah because i remember meeting you and um and and trying to explain what we were trying to do and you were like oh yeah like ding walls yeah yeah I exactly like, i was yeah. like oh, oh, oh wow you know because you know back then that was like a code if you knew yeah. what that was then it was like oh okay you yeah yeah you know Exactly. And I used to go to the record store that Patrick Forge ran, you know, and talk to him a lot and hang out. Um, and the thing was, you know, Sunday afternoon, that was the crazy thing. It was an afternoon club um, playing all of the Norman Connors records and everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And so then I just remember I raced back to London, sold all my stuff, cycled real hard for a few weeks, made more money and then came back out because I'd met some friends and I had a gig in a flea market. Someone said that they would let me work for them in a flea market, Shin, um, selling hats. I was like, was okay, that the flea market? Was that the flea market um, next to Tower Records? Tower Records. Yeah, yeah. 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 I remember Shin. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. So I, I, so basically, I had that, and then I had Giant Step, and I was like, that's enough, because back then you could live in East Village for like you know eighty dollars a week or less or something. I can't remember, but you could make it work. And I was like, you eat falafel and. Um, <laughs> and play and do giant step and sell hats yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. sounds like a good life yeah <laughs> well that's the thing you've got to be you've got to be disciplined and organized uh to live with no money and make the music happen and and, yeah. and one of the things i remember about you richard is you would you know you would practice all the time you were constantly constantly practicing and it's yeah. interesting because you said you didn't really have a formal music education um but you you really put so much time and effort it did it kind of, it looked like it came very naturally to you yeah i had to make up for lost ground i mean once i'm hanging out with people like ital and gordon and uh, and bill and jay and all these guys who've been playing for a long time i had to make up for lost ground in fact i was just recently remembering that one of my greatest musical moments was when i went to midtown uh one of the big music uh, repair shops to get my flute repaired and so I, I grabbed the flute, they gave it to me. And so I'm playing to check on it. And of course, in New York, you're always going to play some stuff. Mm -hmm. And this long legs, I'm sitting on the floor, these long legs come past me with a saxophone case. And a voice, very familiar voice from Blue Note Records says, sounds good, man. I looked up, Sonny Rawlins is walking past me, having just picked up his axe. And I'm like running like, you know, diminished scales and stuff <laughs> everyone knows I come <laughs> says, that was good man and walks off with the same voice you got on those blue note live records live yeah. at vanguard you know right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway then we 
we sort of fashion this this approach, don't we? I mean, the music, if, if, you, if for the musos, the musical side was that at that time with hip hop, 90s hip hop, sampling a lot of jazz, because we're moving on from just straight up funk samples now. And mm -hmm. if you're just playing over a beat and there isn't like a load of other instruments to, to you know, help you out, you, you kind of have to be very mobile and fluid and agile and that's a jazz approach so you know in other words i would play good and then the great thing was once these other guys and roy hargrove and people like that would come along mm -hmm. we used to just because everyone knew it you could just play a little bit of a famous bebop head and the second time you played it everyone joined in no matter what key you played in so you could be like and straight away the next time you did it three horns would jump on it and just that kind of that approach which is you know, a long tradition that we just transposed onto breakbeats, and then, and and you, I mean, but but it, it, it's you know, you you, I think you're being quite modest because you're making it sound very simple. But uh, Smash, who is on, uh, just uh, mentioned something that I think was very very true. He said that you knew not to play over the solos. <laughs> and I think that's a very, that, but that's, it, it's not about what you play. It, it, it's when you don't play, you know what I mean? It's like, and, <laughs> and you, you knew how to do that. Whereas there would be other musicians who would come down who were, I mean, incredible musicians, but they would just play, you know? Yeah. Like, you know. The, the, it used to kill me. So they'd be playing over Earth, Wind and Fire, right? And someone's already taking a solo on the record. I was like, no, 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 right. no, no, no. We got to wait for the break beat where there's the room. And you know, Gordon used to always, Nappy used to always have to wrestle microphone off rappers. You know, right. I was always like taking these musicians with much higher status in the music business, like, no man, shut up, you can't play now. <laughs> it used to just drive me nuts. Yeah. But, but that, that, yeah, it's very, but that, that's, that's a real skill. And I think that's a discipline that you, you kind of like taught the musicians who were more, you know, sort of more sort of like classically or jazz trained than you to learn how to do that on the yeah. giant step stage or else it just would have been a mess. And which is why, yeah. you know, I don't really think it's been duplicated what we were doing. And that's because of the people like you who knew how to do it, you know? Yeah. I mean, if we carry on, on into the live thing and the groove collective and all that stuff, you know, it's kind of nice to, to hear now, I mean, the, the new LA scene, uh, well, it's not new, it's been around for quite a long time now. I mean, I'm blown away now by all these people like Thundercat, especially Mono mm. Neon. Mono Neon is mm. just blows me away to see that people are still working out all these different ways of, and, and hip hop, so interesting. I mean, hip hop, hip hop of the 90s was the, was the focal point actually, that had the flexibility to allow all these different types of music to be played. So you could have someone take a kind of rocky guitar solo. You could have total jazz heads play. You could have an upright bass, because that's what they were sampling. But you could also have someone come in and play funk bass. It, it, and that's still what's happening. It's amazing. I mean, Kendrick Lamar and people are the ones making records that still are an open book for, hey, you've got chops. Don't hide your chops. Don't do the, you know, the pop thing and, and hide your chop. You can come along and, and use them. It's very interesting. So it, it's continued. And, and of course, when I went back to Edinburgh, when I moved back to Britain in 2002, uh, I get there and everyone's listening to The Roots. <laughs> so right. I was able to just keep doing it. <laughs> what What are some of your sort of like favorite memories uh, of the sort of times like when you were, when we, we you know, we were doing the, the, the Giant Step Club and we were traveling around the world and also obviously the groove collective because that became a whole other um you know beast in itself so what, what are some of your favorite memories i'm trying to think i mean the early days also just trying to play different bands that were around at the time so there was the johnny ed was it johnny edwards uh i can't yep. remember uh, johnny edwards. Where, where, yes, I johnny met, edwards. where i met Ital. Ital always oh. says i that I was crawling down under his legs because I'd lost something under the table. And that's when I first met him. But yeah, Ital and, and Nappy coming in and therefore not being quite alone. And then once we hooked up with those guys, that meant Jonathan Marin on bass. But yeah, Ital and Nappy were, this, were a big deal because then between us, we could, we could make stuff happen. The posse. Um, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the but, but particularly posse. just the weight of music. Because honestly, a flute player is not that useful. <laughs> you right. know bass players and guitarists and keyboard players are what you know make a lot of this kind of music happen so that was great and 
I think also just when, again, when the jazz guys, as we always call them, when Bill and Jay and Josh Roseman uh, came downstairs from upstairs <laughs> at the metro <laughs> Metropolis, and um, suddenly we're like, ah, this this is really interesting now. Uh, because they, again, Jay was, was very easy to... Um, to work with because he also picked up that, okay, we're going to play over the break beats and then we're going to shut up. And Jay became like an ally and trying to fight off yeah. musicians yeah. from like playing all <laughs> over the place and stuff. <laughs> oh, it was war. That, it was, it was war it could on that be. stage. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, I think someone, especially it, it's, it's hard to say that the, to beat the metropolis period the 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 low ceiling the sound system everything combined to make it super funky in there but then of course there was recently um because in my teaching i actually uh use cornell west talking about um homophobia in the um red hot and cool uh documentary oh, right yes yes uh, but it's just funny that right at the end of that Red Hot documentary, you can see all of us on stage with Ferris Sanders and people playing the final, like, massive, crazy cadenza. Um, that was pretty amazing, you know, even with the crazy Tony Williams situation. Nonetheless, you know, I, I mean, that's incra crazy. I've been on stage with Tony Williams thundering behind me while I'm playing, like, parts, you know. Um, so the, the Red Hot and Cool was pretty amazing. And actually, um, what was the name of that? venue the the red hot supper club supper yeah the club. supper club that was pretty cool too we got some really good jams happening in the supper club and i'm trying to think of people who would um who who came, who else came down like just so many oh, okay here's a great moment um uh um Gosh, rapper, classic rapper. Now I just lost his name from the original from the original Grandmaster Flash. Great, the Cold Crush Crew, Grandmaster Kaz. No, no, no. From the, from the other, from the other as well. That was always great. But yeah. Grandmaster Flash, you know, um, Melly Mel. Melly Mel. Okay. Melly Mel came on stage and ran it like he was James Brown. They break it down now. Let me hear the drums. <laughs> it got, in other words, totally slipped into exactly that vibe. Which, if you know the first Grandmaster Flash, uh, you know that that first album. It is a lot of it is a live funk album. It's not, you mm -hmm. know, it's not just rapping. It's electro and funk and mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, and and just ran it like a show. Like let me hear the flute now. Break it down. That was a killer jam. Don't think anyone's got that on tape, but that was a killer one. Yeah. No, we don't have that on tape. No. What, what oh, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing about, uh, about KG, the Cold Crush crew. One time I was in Washington Square Park. They used to have to practice in the park because the neighbors would get mad. So I'm in the park again for the Musos and I'm playing Giant Steps chord changes. I'm not playing the famous da da do the melody. I'm playing ba da 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 I'm playing the chord changes. And KG walked past and goes, hey man, that's Giant Steps, isn't it? Yeah. You know, in other words, he picked it up from the chord changes. He knew the wow. music well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it just goes to show that, that they, they, you know, they, they were very, a lot of those rappers were very well versed in, in jazz music, probably from their parents, you know, yeah, growing exactly. up in that. The, the um, crazy thing about hip hop is it's a meritocracy. It could take music from anywhere and make it work. And that, the, you know, as we all know, from the earliest days, Africa Bamba, there's a huge range of music that they used. I love to play that monkey's break for people, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, 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 you know, what about when you were traveling sort of around the world uh, and in different cities? Um, you know, my, my, my biggest memory was just, um, you know, after the show, like having 10 guys in the dressing room, it was like, it was, it was interesting. Yeah, but uh, yeah. the, the traveling was killer, but it's hard to beat like um, shows at the uh, cooler and things. Um, right. But yeah, the first time we hit San Francisco, San Francisco could be pretty amazing. Um, yeah, and then, you know, it was a big deal when we first go to Europe and start playing the big jazz festivals. And I mm -hmm. guess playing the Miles Davis Room at Montreux, and that was a pretty killer show. That, that you know, that was cool. Um, I remember the first tour of Europe when we were playing, like, sort of funky clubs in Berlin and stuff. That was... And actually playing Quasimodo, where Roy Hargrove came down, like, pretty much every night and joined us. That was pretty cool. That was later. But it it would be hard to beat the classic early New York, San Francisco, Chicago gigs that we did. Yeah, you know? yeah. It would, yeah. Which we have some of those on. Uh, we digitized a few of those, and they're they're in the vault. So yeah, uh, people can check out pictures and also the recordings in the vault. Um, what about talking of recordings? I mean, you know, you. <clears throat> 
you know, you recorded the very first sort of like giant step record, Satsuki, uh, you know, giant impressions. And then, then obviously the Groove Collective. Um, Yeah. With Dana, Dana Bryant first, that was the sort of dry run, a couple of things with her, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 You you were, you were Dana's band. I mean, the the kind of Groove Collective kind of started off as Dana's band in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Doing the revamp, the revolution will not be televised. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I, it, um, the, the the one of the I've always really liked recording, um, and like unlike some musicians, I I like overdubbing. I like all of that stuff. So, you know, that was very exciting because again, I was coming from nowhere. So just even imagine. I mean, I thought maybe I would be able to live in New York for a while, learn to play jazz uh, and just about pay the rent and then go back to Britain. So to hear, you know, myself on recording and stuff was was pretty mind boggling. And obviously, then when we have this insane thing where Gary Katz arrives, who you've always wanted to work with, to, yeah. to, to my to my embarrassment at that time, I didn't really know the Steely Dan catalog. Okay. And if I had known the Steely Dan catalog, I might have been almost a bit overawed, but because I right. didn't, I was like, yeah, yeah, man, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, jazz, yeah. got it. <laughs> yeah. 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 For, for those who don't know, um, <clears throat> we, were, we were trying to shop a record deal for, um, for the Groove Collective, and uh, Scott Barkham brought Gary Katz down to the club, and he was besotted and ended up uh, basically walking um, me and Jonathan into uh, Lenny Warnocker's office at, at Warner Brothers and signed a deal like that. Yeah. Um, it, it's a then, fairy yeah. story. It doesn't happen. Yeah. No, no, I, yeah. I couldn't believe it when it, when it happened either. Um, and also repercussions. And then um, separately, yeah. Dana ended up yeah. at Warner Brothers, yeah. but for, from a totally different route as well. So yeah. th- those, those were definitely fun times. <laughs> But um, you see, it was the Sybarite and it was having this yeah. funky night where loads of people were, all the cool people were coming down. There's always this, this thing with an early band where you're underground and so people come down. And so I would say to always the young musicians, you know, you've got, to, you actually have got to run with the music first, unless you're absolutely certain you can be a pop songwriter, you can do that same thing. Then instead you've got to make a scene, which nowadays could just as well be on YouTube. You've got to yeah. make a scene yeah. and have it be a self-supporting thing anyway. So that, yeah, we were all making our $40 a night or whatever, uh, you know, at the more, right. or more that, than that. Maybe, maybe it was more. I just seem to remember There's counting money in the kitchen. That. We were getting more than that. Yeah, yeah. Than that. And, but then, Gary sees that and he's like, okay, <laughs> let's get well, these guys on record. Well, the interesting thing was that you're, you're totally right about the scene. I mean, if we would have gone to record companies and said, we have a 10 piece jazz band <laughs> um, who kind of, they don't really have songs. They just kind of play. Um, what do you think? They go, yeah, see you later. But yeah. because there was so much excitement, there was so much energy coming from the stage from you 10 guys. And literally it was like, every time you guys played, it was like, well, fasten up your seatbelt because we do not know where this shit is going to (laughs) go. And then you've got all these, you know, young, cool people coming down and beautiful models. um, And, and, you know, the, the, the label people would go, how did this all happen? And, you know, that's why, you know. Yep self self generating scene yeah yes. but it has to but it has to musically hold together i mean that was another Correct. thing we were aware of like okay we've got to play music that has as much um you know appeal as the dj playing music where people can totally be at the front listening or dancing or hanging out talking all at once you know which is well i always wanted to have that 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 village vibe of of, of music that can just be existing what what one community. of my one of my fondest memories actually of the Groove Collective was when we did the record release party for the first <laughs> album at AKA, oh, an... yes. which was above um, uh, on uh, Halston and West Broadway. Houston. And yeah. I think the show lasted five minutes before the yeah. fire brigade came to just shut that place down because it yeah. was just too crowded it, yeah it was way yeah. too crowded yeah forgot about aka you see it because i don't live in new york i forget about all these, these different places that's right aka yeah right yeah 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 that was... so so richard we we don't have a lot of time i want to no. i want to hear a little bit about you know what you you know when you left new york because you've 
created this, you know, you're, you're an academic. So yeah, I got I a PhD. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, got, I got my first, I, I'm, I'm like an early career PhD, even though I'm like 55. Um, I've got a, like um, uh, a, a chapter coming out in a book. Um, it's coming out in March where I've written about, well, I managed to get it from Davy Graham and Psychedelia in British, like mid 60s rock, actually to Arrested Development, because it's about the pastoral in popular music. Hmm. Anyway, so yeah, I'm an academic. I still play. Um, what, what, do you, what do you, what do you, what is your uh, PhD in and what do you okay. teach? Yeah. My PhD is composition. I did it with this crazy professor, Nigel Osborne, who, uh, who basically plays, uh, takes music to refugee camps all over the planet for children. He's done that for a long time. But he was a classical composer, very like 19, uh, late, 19, uh, late 20th century modernist composer. So I did a PhD writing music primarily. Uh, for orchestral music mainly. So, you know, the full string synth. And I still teach some of that at university. So I teach, you know, orchestration composition, but I also teach popular music composition. So don't worry, I'm teaching kids how to do two, five, one progressions in, in composition. I, I also was very concerned. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I also teach popular music history. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and I, yeah, and, I, and I'm just starting to get some writing done as well as the other research I do is where I play usually other people's music. So I did like last year I was in Prague playing essentially classical music, but where I'm improvising. So it's pretty tricky. I got to read classical music, then take a blast solo, then land back in the right place to rejoin the score. It's like being in Return to Forever, only with wow. violins instead of chicory. <laughs> uh, wow. That was some challenging stuff. So I still do occasionally push it out there, but I'm kind of lazy on the playing side, you know. I like to go to bed on time. So, um, right. so yeah, they, and, and honestly, marking people's essays and marking their compositions and all of this sensible stuff as an academic, you know, that's quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and and how's it been? I mean, obviously, you're now working remotely. How how's it been teaching remotely? In, well, in even though I, even though I don't have a smartphone, I'm I'm all right with technology. Um, so I I can teach a Zoom lecture pretty well. I mean, the key thing was to realize you could share audio, and I've also got a keyboard that I can play that's virtual that plays on the screen. So I, oh, wow. I've developed a load of stuff to deal with that. So it's okay. The kids are, are doing fine, but they, they miss like live lectures, of course. Yeah. Uh, and they, they, you know, that, I mean, it's easy for me, but for a 19 year old to have to be confined to their uh, uh, flat and having to do everything online, it, it's pretty intense. So you've got to look after them a bit more currently, but I've had some great compositions done by them. And, uh, you know, and if I can spend an hour on Zoom playing lots of Parliament Funkadelic and a popular history, you know, we're doing OK. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what are some of the other artists you do you, uh, you teach in popular music history? Well, you see, I, in the popular music history, I, it's basically American Anglo. So I don't do the world music side. That they can do in second year. So mm -hmm. I, I do go back and I try to show people how the early American popular music of, of what we call blues now, country music, that there were these musicians who played all kinds of music, but it was segregated by the record companies in the 20s and essentially African-American is blues and white becomes hillbilly country. But it's not really, it's much more complex than that, the relationships. So I try to get that to them and work through um, to, you know, the first rock and roll, the architects, Chuck Berry is, develops the guitar rock and roll, Little Richard, and yes, Elvis, but you have to try and rebalance the, the historical narrative there. And then on through, you know, progressive rock, punk rock, you know, the, 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 the classic argument that punk rock hated progressive rock, even though we then found out that all the punk rockers owned progressive rock records, of course, because mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. you know, Johnny Rotten once had long hair. Mm -hmm. And the reason he had a T-shirt that said Pink Floyd sucks was because he had a Pink Floyd T-shirt in the first place. People always forget that. And mm -hmm. I take that through. And of course, hip hop is a big linchpin because it draws together all these other musics that have been happening. And, and funk, I, I had to add a whole week of funk where we just deal with... Because, you know, 1967 is this year people talk about when, uh, you know, Sergeant Pepper's Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. But it's also the year that James Brown did Cold Sweat. Yeah, yeah. It's all yeah. part of the 67 myth. Yeah, yeah. So funk is correct. invented. Yeah, uh, by P uh, uh, Alfred P. Wee Ellis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and he admits freely that he stole from Miles Davis' So What in that process. Uh. You know, 
Da -da. He always mm. there's a great clip mm. you can find where he talks about being on a tour bus and James Brown says, hey, write this down and starts going, uh, 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 which is the bass line and, and Pee Wee writes it down <laughs> on the tour bus, you know. And wow. this is also an interesting thing, musical literacy, you know. These guys, well, you know, Pee Wee and people totally knew yeah. what they were doing. Yeah. I had some fun times with Fred Wesley in Edinburgh. Yeah. <laughs> when he came to play Edinburgh. <laughs> Richard, Richard, I, I know. I, we ha we have to we have to move move on to um, to Gordon, who's yep. who's in Germany. Um, you know, I would I would love to continue the conversation, but this has been brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, I cool. think you I think you just log off, and then yep. okay. um, I'm going to have Gordon log on. But thank you, Richard. It was great yeah, yeah. seeing you. So and I'm happy. I'm gonna, I, well, please stay on and watch, you know. Yeah, I'm going to yeah, yeah. try and log off. I don't know which part okay. of the press. Let's okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> He'll still be on. Leave, Gordon, leave. are you there? There we go. Gordon? Uh, okay, there we go. Waiting for the real Nappy G to join. That was awesome. Thank you, Richard. Oh, there you are. Hey, yeah, there he is. Hey, man. Good to see you. Gordon, t tell, tell everybody where you are because um, you're- Hey, yeah. I'm, in, I'm in Hamburg, Germany. Yeah, ich bin auf Deutschland, yeah. Um, and I just watched the whole thing with Richard. That was great, man. I, I had so many things I wanted to jump in. Like, <laughs> oh, wait, but, uh, but, and then- uh, <laughs> Well, well now, now's your shot. So, um, <laughs> For those who don't know, uh, Gordon, a.k.a. Nappy G, um, was uh, the uh, percussionist and, and an MC at, at the early Giants that night. But, you know, you're, you know, obviously a lot more than that. And um, I think I think it would be great for you to talk a little bit quickly about how you got to New York and your early influences, because you've been in New York a while when we um, when we started. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you know. I wasn't there that long before you started, but my main, I, I grew up uh, son of two preachers in the AME church. So we moved around every couple of years. So I was born in Chicago and moved to Iowa for a couple of years and then Canada for a couple of years and then Kentucky for from fourth grade till 10th grade ish. And then I went to boarding school in New Hampshire and then I went to college at Columbia for a little while, for about a year and a half before I left school to join a psychedelic rock band. Who but was that? What was the psychedelic rock band? That called? that band was called Dream Speak, and it was a totally. I was into all kinds of music, but growing up in middle school and, and elementary school, I played snare drum in, in concert band, and then I went on to marching band in high school, and you know did the whole you know concert band challenges and state competitions, and I became section leader. So I was really into. I did drum camp and all that stuff. But I had congas, and my aunt gave me congas when I was 12, and I was going to this summer program at Duke University when I was 12 or 13. And at the same university, they also had the American Dance Festival with Chuck Davis, and it was Martha Graham's ADF. And it's my first time that I could play the congas with drummers who were new African drumming. And I thought that I could come out and play with them because they were, and I thought it was just a jam session. Right. Yeah. So I, I brought my drums out and I start playing with them and they look at me like, who is this kid? Like, what are you doing? How and old are you? How old are you? I was uh, 12 or 13. Oh, wow. So you were like a little kid. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and these were grown ass yeah. men, you know, <laughs> and they were like, yo, 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 stop, stop, stop. Here, here's a cowbell. We're going to teach you how to play from the beginning. You're going to learn every part. And for the next three summers, I started learning West African drumming with these guys while simultaneously going back to school and doing marching band. And so when I got to New York, one of the first people I, I met at Columbia was a guy I heard playing congas out on the quad. And he was playing these rhythms I never heard, which were Haitian rhythms from Haiti. And it's really Central Africa, Congolese. And as Danny Wyatt me and him ended up starting this acoustic kind of repercussions crew at that time. Then I got into so the psychedelic so that's, how, so that's how the band had the name Repercussions because it was a percussion yes. based. Oh, okay. Yes, it was all Haitian. We were doing all Haitian traditional voodoo rhythms. Our first gig with just three drummers was at Liz Selassie's birthday party, Haile Selassie's granddaughter. Wow. <laughs> she went to Columbus, she went to Barnard. 
and we played her birthday party. And still to this day, we always laugh about how like this weird coming together of all these cultures only happens in New York. It's yeah. like, and one of the things about going to school in New York was I always felt like I'm missing out on the real education happening downtown at these clubs. I need mm -hmm. to go. So it was always this push and pull of like, do I want to be in school just to get a degree for this thing? I know I'm probably not going to use or go do the music thing. So I ended up going more for the music. Also, uh, you know, Columbia was super expensive. And, you know, the, the, this is in the Reagan years. The, the grant money started to run out. They started cutting funding, you know, grant money. And so I left school and joined this hippie band. But then I, after two years, I was, like, feeling this new vibe. I needed to get in touch with my roots. Soul to Soul record came out, blew my mind, the funky dreads. Mm -hmm. I had little short hair. I said, okay, I want to grow dreads. I got it turned it into little mm -hmm. tiny braids. Mm -hmm. And Andy Ferranda, the guitar player, he was like, look at your little nappy hair, man. You're like mm -hmm. a nappy G. <laughs> I was like, yes, I am a nappy G. I'm proud ah. of it. And that became, I, I claimed the nickname because Andy tried to insult me with it. And I was like, no, I am a nappy G, man. I'm proud of it. <laughs> and so, yeah, De La Soul. Yeah, Soul to Soul, De La Soul. Uh, Tribe Called Quest, all this stuff around AL, Rakim, Eric B. and Rakim, mm -hmm. 89, mm -hmm. started really changing my perspective. I wanted to be part of that. And, you know, so this band Repercussions, we were trying to build something with this. We had met this singer, for, you know, it was me and Danny, and then we got and the Andy. And his name was? Nicole Willis. Nicole, yeah. Nicole Willis. <laughs> now she's with the Soul Investigators and mm -hmm. on her own solo career mm -hmm. and He's awesome. Mm -hmm. But the, Andy said, I know this awesome singer. And he, we had to drag her in. And she didn't want to do it. She was too shy to sing at that time. She came only with her friend. If her friend came for moral support to help her sing. Her friend was Dana Bryant. <laughs> I never knew that. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, it's all connected, man. It's yeah, so crazy. Yeah. So she brought Dana, and Dana would kind of just hang out and be there to just give Nicole, like, good vibes while Nicole was getting comfy singing this with this new band. And then after a while, Andy was like, and Chill Freeze, Andy and Chill Freeze said, hey, man, we know this drummer. We used to hear him back in high school. He was great, man. He doesn't play anymore, but if we could find this guy. And we found this dude. He was working at a radio station. He hadn't been playing for a while. He was, like, cutting tape. This is Genji, Genji mm -hmm. Serace. Mm -hmm. And we, we brought him in to come play with us. He was also very reluctant, like, oh, I don't know, man. I don't do it. <laughs> I'm not very good. Yeah. <laughs> and then he killed it. In this, and we were like, this guy just needs to play more, and we'll just get him back in. So that's, that's our repercussions. So I, I think the first repercussions gig I did with you guys, you didn't even have a drummer. Was no, we cool. didn't. Yeah, yeah. We, we we had a drummer at first. It wasn't working. Then we said, right. let's just do a drum machine yeah, drum until machine. we yeah, find yeah. the right guy. Yeah. And, and we were looking for that guy. And that guy ended up being Genji, obviously. Um, and, you know, it's it, it's just crazy. So anyway, during all this time period, I was trying to find extra work. I had been working at a, at a publishing company, and I got laid off. I was on unemployment. So I was looking for, you know, gigs and I started doing promotion for SOBs for Larry. And, you know, I had these flyers and I kept started seeing promos for Giant Step. And I was like, what is this? What, what is I don't know what this is. It looked cool. The photos were so all these old jazz albums, beautiful artwork, but I didn't know what it was. But one night after a rehearsal, I came by SOBs. And I think I was trying to pick up some flyers or something, but I heard the music and I just opened the door and looked in and I saw all these amazing like films on the wall and the room was pretty empty. I want to say it was maybe two people. That sounds about right. There were more people working for us than there were there. Yes, it was a very yeah. good business model. Yeah. yeah it was smash, <laughs> smash with DJing. Richard was playing flute. And Sam I Am was doing the centipede across an empty floor. That's about <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, but the music was amazing. And yeah. I was like, whoa, what is this? And I think I had a conga drum with me. I had one conga. And I went up and I asked Richard and Smash, can I jam with you? And they were like, okay, if yeah. you know how to play. I was like, yeah, man, don't worry. Let's do this. 
And we started having a lot of fun and there was nobody there. So we could, I started to catch the format of like, you know, play more when there's nothing happening, when there's vocals and a solo lay back. And I started to realize this DJ is the drummer in this band. We should follow him like the drummer. Like when he changes, we change. And that concept, as simple as it is, just like you talk with Richard, so many musicians just can't understand that. It's a, yeah. a basic concept. But yeah. once you get it, it's like, okay, right, that's the guy we listen to. And and then you start to get this interplay where he's listening to you also. The DJ, It starts to be, okay, the DJ is listening to us. We're listening to him. We can start to talk to the DJ. Like, we're going to do this if you do that. And then it starts to be a thing where we're arranging together. Mm -hmm. And but Rick was key in all of that because he was the first guy who really was hearing how to put head the head of a classic song on top of this bass line or just this beat. And then I and then I could play percussion and the DJ could drop out and we could hold it for a little bit and he'd come back in. And then gradually as more as as it all came in and Genji Genji came with me after one rehearsal. And was like, yo, this is, I love this, man. This is the joint. And it just started to really pick up. The Me, Genji, and Atal, and Richard were able to have enough of a rhythm section that Smash or Jazzy could actually drop out and we could hold it. And, yep, and the dance floor and, would still be going. And that, that was when you had the, is it live or is it Memorex moment where people, people yeah. didn't know. And that was, that was a yeah. beautiful thing. That, those about, were the moments. Yeah, it wasn't about watching. That's why we always wanted the stage to be low, so yeah. people weren't like just staring at you know. Yeah. Like, no, no, no! Don't look at us. Just dance. Yeah, just interact. That's mm -hmm. it. And, and that was the other thing. Even as it turned into Groove Collective, one of the things we always kept was we don't want it to be a break between the DJ and when we start. We if there's a good vibe. Why kill the vibe just to have this ego moment mm -hmm. of announcing us? Like once yeah. we start playing, people will figure it out. Mm -hmm. So we were just like, let's flow. And we would try to find out from the DJ, what's the last song you're going to play? Mm -hmm. So we can join in on that and then just segue across. And those kind of flowing moments, it wasn't about a, a showmanship. It was just about the feel, the vibe. We don't want to lose the vibe because it was so good, you know, with the people and the, the music. So very special, man. Very special. So, um, you know, you, you were in Repercussions. You were in the Giant Step, like, original crew, which turned into the Giant Step Posse, which turned into the Giant Step Septet, which then turned into the Groove Collective. Um, you were kind of like, you know, you, Genji, and Jonathan were like sort of very omnipresent. I mean, talk a little bit about your experience sort of with both bands because, you know, you you got recording deals with major record companies, you were making albums, you were touring, you know. It was, it, it was they were really different experiences in the sense that repercussions was more like uh, – I don't want to say pop, but we were definitely trying to uh, create a sound. We knew what we were going for, whether we got it or not. We knew we had something we were trying to reach musically and artistically. Groove Collective was much more free and open and really never had some vision from the beginning. It was this chemistry, this natural chemistry of these people and these musicians and the instruments we had worked so well together with our vibe it, it became more like almost like a, a almost not a meditation or just it was very free in that sense we did start to write and create and figure out ways to coalesce these these kind of different mindsets into songwriting but the initial feeling and even the, the shows as we did the shows it was more open because when you're trying to make songs for the radio, which I feel like Repercussions was going in that direction more and was trying to have more things that were uh, more in a format that people knew, uh, it, you, you stick to certain kind of formats and, and formulas of how you write and arrange. And Groove Collective was a lot more open in that sense of like some of the guys came from the jazz world, some came from the funk world. 
and we all had this sort of sense of seeing how it worked on a dance floor. We, we Giant Step was the testing ground every week to see how does this stuff work for people in real life. Like, we don't have to wonder. We know that if we put that head over this beat, people love it. We could have tried to come up with that, but it happened and we did it by accident and it works. And the improvisational spirit, that kind of group trance almost, it really carried over. And, and Richard was great about saying, in that moment, those 30 seconds, we got this thing, that's part of a song. Let's take that part. Let's take this part. And Richard would identify these moments that would happen organically. And then we'd kind of pull those out and make those the building blocks of song. So, you know, I feel like it was, it was a different, uh, the, the, the whole uh, vibe of it was different. One was kind of more uh, by the book and one was more just freestyle. So Repercussions was a little more by the book and, and Groove Collective was more freestyle in terms of how we did everything. And it was very much a democracy for better and for worse. <laughs> there were no leader, 10 people. It was like a, a monster with 10 heads. And it was like, <laughs> and as, as the manager, it was like, who, who am I dealing with? You know, like, yeah. like one person would agree to something and then someone else wouldn't. And they'd be like, oh my God, you know, it's like, it was, yeah. It, I mean, it was, it, I mean, you know, under different circumstances, if we kind of knew a little bit more back then, because we, I didn't know what yeah. I was doing. Who, you guys, no, we, we were making up as we went along. Um, you know, it would have been right, you know, right. One of you guys is the Groove Collective and everyone else is like a hired hand. And you know, <laughs> like, kind of like the Jamiroquai model where, you know, JK yeah, yeah. was Jamiroquai yeah. and everyone else was a hired hand. You know, but, but, but you wouldn't get that same songwriting. That's the no. thing. No, definitely you know that no. we, w the best meeting we ever had as a band, which was a long, horrible, terrible meeting, was to finally decide what are we going to do with our publishing. How and we finally had this long, long meeting and decided to split it equally because you know we looked at the history of bands and groups that had split up and why, and mm -hmm. ultimately it always comes down to this feeling of somebody's left out or somebody feels un disrespected and. And our, the, when you write as a group and people are adding little parts, it's hard to say which part was the thing. Yeah. You know, there's a formula of melody and lyrics that's the you know, standard formula, but when it's an instrumental band and it's a group composition, it's kind of like, and, and that meeting I felt like was when we all said, we're going to respect each other ultimately as musicians, as people, and whatever happens, we'll all just give it our best and try. And, and I think when you make people side men and it's, they only give X amount, when you don't, when you say that we're all equal in it, it makes you, so you all have to try. So it's a, it's a, it's challenging. I, I don't recommend it for a lot of kids out there, but, <laughs> but I'm glad we did it that way. <laughs> yeah. And that's how the, I mean, a, a, another band that comes to mind where they split all their publishing equally is you too. And right. They, right. You know, um, they stay together. They stay together, yeah, and uh, have done very well out of it. Yeah, that, that that's that's amazing. Um, what are some of your sort of like favorite, couple of favorite memories? Um, Woo! You know? <laughs> <laughs> there's so many, but uh, okay. Well, one, there's a okay. One is when uh, early, early, early when Dana Bryant was opening, we opened for Gil Scott Heron, and we were doing the Revolution will not be televised. And I'll never forget being down in the dressing room at SOBs before we were going to play. And we were all kind of awestruck, you know, and I, I'd actually seen Gil a couple of times at some Groove Academy shows that you guys, you mm -hmm. and Jonathan had thrown. Mm -hmm. But to be there hanging out with him and, and Dana was like kind of starstruck too. Like, Oh, we you know, we're doing, you know, your <laughs> song. We, we hope you don't mind. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> all right. It's not going to be a revolution. No revolution. We were just like, no, no. <laughs> but yeah, there were some great ones too. Um, when Lonnie Liston Smith came to sit in one night at Metropolis, uh, another really funny moment. This is like 91 when In Living Color, the TV show was on and I mm -hmm. loved it so much. And, and just let me just say, I love, I love Vernon Reed and, Corey Glover and Muzz and Will Calhoun. Somebody came up and told, whispered to me, I'm emceeing a packed house, like, yo, yo, 
In Living Color is here. I was like, oh, In Living Color. <laughs> on the microphone, like, yo, Jamie Foxx, In Living Color is here. They're like, no, 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 Living Color. I was like, oh, Living Color is here. Everybody was like, oh. <laughs> but actually, it turned, Will Calhoun, the drummer, he took it as a challenge because mm-hmm. he saw the energy change because we right. didn't think it was, he just started playing the funky drummer beat and killed it so hard that it was like, okay, he flipped the crowd back over. Uh, another great moment when the Freestyle Fellowship came, uh, they were these MCs from LA, mm-hmm. this amazing improvisational crew, like on another mm-hmm. level. Oh, and yeah. there were every MC that I love in New York pretty much was lurking in the corner somewhere in Metropolis just to check these guys out. There were like so many big name heads. And over the years, I mean, all the like diggable, all the guys from diggable used to come hang out there before they did their record. We met King Brick way before, uh, you know, butterfly, all those cats. Um, I remember Tito, Tito Puente came once in Metropolis and just hung out and just watched. I didn't know he was there till he was leaving. And I was like, oh, my God, no. <laughs> um, just, yeah, like Richard mentioned, uh, the, the Red Hot and Cool, of course, you know, playing with all those amazing cats and just seeing the, the just the living legends, you know, Ron Carter, Last Poets, all those kind of people. Uh, you know, it was just, there's so many amazing memories, man. It was just like we... And traveling, all those trips, the first trips we did to Japan and Italy in 92. You, you, I just remember your face after, <laughs> like when you went to Japan, when we went to Japan for the first time. It was like you had died and gone to heaven. You were oh, man. You were Japanese. It was like, it was like, like Gordon's <laughs> going to be coming back here. You, you, you <laughs> loved it. <laughs> I love it. It's a, it's a great country, man. Yeah. It really it just, But just all those... Also getting respect. I was just when we would go to do these festivals in other countries as Groove Collective and people all knew the Giant Step scene. Giant Step, st- it always got respect. A lot of musicians said, oh, I always wanted to come jam there. I always wish I, I wanted to come jam there. Those jams we had with Roy Hargrove at Village Gate. Amazing. You know, you know when he would come from one of his other, I think he was playing at Birdland. He'd come in in a suit. And then he would change into some overalls and just come rip it with us. And, 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 his, and his sidekick, trombone. Oh, oh. He had his not, trombone sidekick. Trombone shorty. No, not trombone no, shorty. No. It was, uh, I know who you're talking yeah, about. I can't yeah. remember his name. But yeah, Graham Haynes. I mean, just, oh, man, there were so many cats. Oh. And just, just everybody was always so nice. Also, the... Um, the Supper Club, when you did the record release for New York and Soul, oh, man, that was amazing. That was just like, we didn't play, but that was just one of those nights of, like, star power beyond. And all the Supper Club gigs, we had so much fun at the Supper Club. I mean, just shout out to Tamango. Uh, that's a great story, too, also from a Kim Funk Buddha. Mm-hmm. That speak, the tap dancing crew, uh, Tamango, Urban Tap, had an amazing tap hip hop jazz incredible. presence and he did an incredible show. We actually did something in Argentina with him. Mm-hmm. That's when me and John and, and Uruguay. And and you and there Uruguay were pictures of all that stuff I was telling Tamango when he was like, hey, nobody talked yeah. about me. And it's like, dude, go to yeah. the vault. You're all over it. <laughs> the vault is amazing, by the way. You guys did an incredible job Thank archiving. You. But there was one thing night- over COVID. <laughs> But <laughs> one night at Giant Step, the power went out. I'll never forget this at Metropolis. And Akim was there, Akim Funk Buddha, and he taped some spoons to the bottom of his shoes. And he just started with duct tape and he started tap dancing on the floor. And then me and him and Genji started jamming. And he did this move. I remember where he ran up and did a flip off. The, he ran up the wall and did a backflip with these shoes with spoons on. There were so many moments like that that just you can't plan that stuff. Like you just, you know, it, it yeah. was just incredible. It was really every night you never knew what was going to happen, but you knew it would be amazing. And, you know, it was to be able to do that in New York in the 90s and actually make a pretty good living from it. Mm-hmm. It was a blessing, truly a blessing. Yeah. I don't know if something no, like we that. will. I don't know if that can happen again. I don't know. 
<laughs> Unless we become influencers on uh, Instagram, um, we, we, we don't have we don't have a lot of time, Gordon. But I do want to talk a little bit about sort of like your, you know, because you you went on and you you joined Nick at Turntables on the Hudson. You went into DJing. You now live in. So tell us, a, bring us up to speed okay. a little bit on that. It, yeah. it all, you know, yeah. the Nicodemus Nicodemus was like the last DJ who was your, the regular weekly at Giant Step. He was a young kid. He was probably still in his teen years, late teens. Yeah, I didn't realize how young he was when he Yeah, started. he was not, I don't know if he was legal. <laughs> no, he was not. I think he was 12. <laughs> was playing at the bank. We met at the bank and I loved him. I loved his vibe. And then he started doing this thing uh, uh, with grooves. another. Organic yeah, yeah, grooves. organic. Exactly. Organic grooves, which is kind of more dubby and, but it had an improvisation feel. A lot of people in New York figured out a way to take this formula and sort of evolve it that we had created at Giant Step and sort, you know, do it their mm -hmm. own way. Yep. And I think Organic Grooves did it in the really proper way. They had yeah, great cool musicians who, and they did more dubby and electronic and got a little more, you know, housey sometimes, but they also were great. Nick would play there. I'd go jam with him. Mariano, the other conga player, he also would pl play with me, and we said, let's do another thing. Mariano wanted to DJ, and so we wanted to play more house, too, and mix it up. So we started Turntables on the Hudson. So, But it all came back to this, this Giant Step Foundation. So me and Nick, you know, we did Turntables for 20 years. I started DJing in late 99, 2000. After all these years of playing with DJs, I finally realized – I could probably do this because it's rhythmic. It's tied into drumming to me. It's all DJing, DJing and drumming are same family to me. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing both. And as the years went by, then I finally kept coming back to Europe every summer, even after the Groove Collective stuff. And I realized I had connections here and I started building those and, and cultivating those. And around, uh, 2016 2015 i started wanting to move to europe and i was taking a look at what's going on somebody in berlin told me that donald trump was going to win the presidency in the summer of 2015 and i just didn't believe i was like no way no way uh -uh, it's a joke come on and they were like nope it's gonna happen you guys are headed towards fascism you need to get out i was like what really <laughs> and i had a german girlfriend in new york at the time and I came back and I said, maybe we should think about this. It may, can America do that? And we were like, well, they did vote for George W. Bush twice. Hmm. Hmm. Let's start planning. So we started looking into it. We looked all over, finally decided, OK, let's go to a cool. I like Hamburg because it's not uh, it's not the main city port in terms city. of it's a port. It's a, port. Yeah. It's a harbor. It's a port. And it's mm -hmm. been here hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Very open minded, very liberal, progressive. And they actually have a hip hop funk soul scene, mm -hmm. uh, which well, I didn't know that? about. Yeah. yeah, I didn't. I didn't know that. I, so I kind of. Yeah, yeah, Mojo. Exactly. I knew Mojo, but I didn't know anything else besides Mojo. And it turns out there's a really cool scene. I'm playing with this funk band here called Superbad that actually does, they do James Brown instrumental covers with a DJ scratching breaks, and then we add vocals on top. And it's like, all of this stuff is all connected. I feel like my life, it just keeps going back to this giant step thing. It's like, can't get away from it, but I don't want to, I love it. So it's just, you know, I'm teaching some rhythm here. I'm producing, uh, if you want to, I got stuff on Mixcloud. My DJ mixes are all on Mixcloud, Nappy G and, band camp and blah 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 but man i really the archive man I, if if you have not checked out the archive people go to the giant step archive vault amazing yeah, go to the vault um we're gonna have to we're gonna have to cut it uh because or else they're gonna cut us off so um what we're what's gonna happen now is um we are gonna switch over to uh another ig live we, got, we have to leave this one we're gonna okay. start another one uh, okay. So everybody, if you can just switch over when I when I go live again, and I'm going to have Ital Shaw and Genji Seresi. So thank you, Richard. Thank you, Gordon. It's been awesome. Uh, thank, thank you, Morris. All the, all the great old faces of, and new old faces that have joined. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to start up again in literally 30 seconds. So thank all right, you, everyone. thanks, guys. See you in 30 seconds. Take care. Peace, y'all. Love you.
Chao, chao.